Good morning, afternoon, wherever you are. Morning, Taylor. Hey, Bill. Good morning. Hotel. We'll get started in a few minutes. Um, Ian's leading today. He should be joining any minute now. Morning, everybody. Good morning. Right, it's five o'clock, it's time to start. Um, okay, um, first question. Um, I know what my vote is, but uh, I see we've got a holiday coming up, um, the Labor Day holiday on the 6th of September. Uh, anybody feel that they want a meeting on the 6th of September or that they don't? Uh, being as the agenda is empty even for today, <laughs> it seems obvious. Uh, all right. Well, we'll take the uh, we'll take the skip. Um, I'm good with that. I'm not blame you. All right. Uh, standard um, thing that keeps coming up: uh, Coop Common ONES in Los Angeles. I um, don't know who's going and who's not, but we do have our deep dive session on the working group itself. Uh, if anyone's got any other sessions they think are going to be relevant to members, then um, stick them in here. 
um, so that we all know what's coming up. Um, otherwise, um, yep, it's it's there. Don't forget about it. Uh, we also have uh, the Mobile World Congress Los Angeles coming up at the end of October. Um, I have no idea who's planning on going to that even, but um, if, uh, again, there's any interesting things going on there that you think are worth no letting the members know about, then um, do go ahead and tell us what's going on. Um, uh, I do have a general question about KubeCon. Um, yep. I've had... I've never had luck <laughs> with uh, KubeCon. Right now, I had two different talks that were not accepted, one which was a joint talk with Ericsson. Um, any insight about you know, how KubeCon is willing to accept telco? I, I have a feeling they think, oh, the telco stuff should go in ONES and not in KubeCon. But that just might be my guess. I, I really don't know. Does, does anybody here have some insight? Yeah, it's it's always been really difficult getting telecom talks into into KubeCon. So your experience there is, is not uh, is not isolated. All right, thanks. Yeah, I think you have to remember that KubeCon's audience is very very broad. So um, you know we're we're always at a disadvantage there talking about a very small subset of users compared to the entirety of what's going on. Mind you, you could have said the same of OpenStack, and OpenStack at least we used to manage to get talks in. Um, so uh, I think yeah. the terminology is a blocker too, and I've seen a few of the submissions that that it looks like it would go into ONES, and I'm I'm guessing OpenStack, being that there's a lot of development that was happening at the time, use. You'd have known terminology, but if you have someone that's doing reviews that doesn't even um, see where it fits in. Yeah, well, I, uh, also uh, KubeCon's twice the size that the OpenStack summits were even at their peak. So um, again, it's um, much more overloaded with talks, I think. So uh, they're looking for broad appeal um, to try and you know, get to as many of that audience as possible. Uh, oh, it only yes, obviously is much more focused on specifically the users that we care about, um, but obviously less focused on specifically the software that we're dealing with. So um, it, it's a, also an odd combination, but that's where we stand. Um, yeah, I mean, I totally agree. Um, and I don't know um, that the, I don't know who, does the reviewing of talks for KubeCon or how they select that panel. Um, perhaps next time round, we try and establish that a little bit earlier or maybe maybe get our fingers in the pie and get a reviewer on the panel. Um, that would probably get us a bit further. Yeah, so I, I, uh, go ahead, Roderick. Yeah, so I've, I've been a part of these particular, uh, of a couple of these things for KubeCon, and they usually will pull between six to eight people through the industry to do a vote, and then they'll get two people to chair it, who then uh, do the, the final selection. But uh, generally, there is a networking track, uh, but the, one of the things they did, they did historically, which should help in future KubeCons, is they finally split service mesh from, from networking. So networking would only have would, would have a relatively small number of, of available slots. And then when you mix it in with service mesh, it, it was pretty difficult to get anything that was actually networking related into the networking track. So I think there are some things that can improve, but uh, they do have a they do have a process for for feedback on some of this stuff. So I, I would recommend that we uh, develop a little bit of feedback on some of the things that we're struggling with and uh, respond to them so that we can get a better structure in the future where we can we can get uh, talks in that are related to uh, to this particular industry. Mm -hmm. Bill, as I'm on the inside, what have you got to say on the subject? Yeah, so I, I dropped a link in the chat um, talking, and this is from the latest KubeCon, it's talking about uh, the selection process and kind of like all the numbers behind it. Um, I think what Frederick said is like also true that it's um, 
yeah, it's good. Yeah, going into the numbers, the acceptance rate is low, but I think it'll be helpful if they split out now that like service mesh and networking are split out because they're two very different topics. <laughs> Right, okay. Um, I'm gonna keep that for later, later examination, but um, let's see. Uh, right, um, the o, uh, as I say, the ONES obviously is a better target for the things that we're talking about in, a, in one way. Um, so um, again, uh, I don't know if anyone knows speakers at the ONES or specifically relevant talks. But again, if you want to get them a little bit of free advertising, then make sure you tell us what's going on. Um, and uh, we will uh, keep an eye out for that. Then we can go and heckle. Um, I also don't know how many of you are actually planning on attending in person. And I suspect anyone's plans at this point in time are subject to change. Um, speaking personally, I'm likely to be out of the country at the time that it happens, which may have been arguably poor planning. But we'll see how this works out. Uh, my plans might change just the same as everything else. Um, okay, since nobody wants to talk about anything else, I stuck in a note there about least privileges because uh, Taylor and I have been riffing on this for a, a few weeks at this point to try and establish the whys and the whats. Um, we've got the review already out there for the best practice, um, but the best practice obviously didn't have any justification. It was just, here's the best practice. Um, and we'd like to have use cases that speak to best practices. Um, I'm not sure the document we have is exactly a use case yet, but it is a, uh, a wide variety of thoughts on the subject. And uh, I have a link for it, I hope. That one. Maybe that one. Yes, that one. So um, this, um, Taylor, you said you've made it public, did you? Yeah, this is in the um, CNF Working Group Google Drive. Right, it's got all of our notes from, from the various meetings we've had, because um, we've been talking about this sort of offline for a few weeks at this point. Um, but we tried to break this down to um, uh, at least some of the whys and the wherefores. I, I think what's clear here is this isn't a use case in the sense of this is a specific thing that a telco would want to do. It's more a, a use case in the sense of um, least privilege is, an accept is a widely accepted principle for the purposes of um, uh, well, among other things, security, but also stability. Um, and we were trying to basically frame that up into in terms of the advantages it would bring in the specific problem space that we have. And the reason that the problem space makes it difficult to, uh, to deliver um, based on the fact that we're doing specific networking applications and they bring a range of problems where privilege is often called for. Um, so to begin with, um, least privilege, the reason I would suggest that it was it, it's important is because if you're trying to work with a platform and a selection of applications, then you break isolation if you give any of the higher privileges that are going on. What you know we would call a privilege container is obviously a privilege, but it's only one form of privilege. We've talked about root users in containers as well. Both of them... Uh, well, specifically the platform privileges tend to break isolation between applications and application platform. And if you do that, then you start to lose the sense of a boundary between components. And without a boundary, without establishing what a component is trying to deliver, then you run into the difficulty of working out where problems arise when they come up. Um, if I have a privileged application and it's got power to change all networking in the system, and then my basic CNI, Calico, whatever stops working, then do I call the platform team because Calico is a platform component? Do I call the application team because the application could have broken Calico? If I call the platform team, how do they establish that the application didn't do anything untoward that led to that breakage? It's 
um, least privilege basically isolates applications from each other and from the platform to the point that when you have a problem, you can point a finger at a team and say, this was your component, you were responsible for it, you are the one who will be able to fix it for me, who will be able to find the problem as soon as possible. So I think that's an important reason why sticking to the least quantity of privileges necessary to get things working is beneficial. Uh, protection, I mean, this one's the one that's been coming up in the uh, in the use in the best practice more, but it's only one part of the problem. Protection is basically saying that if problems uh, arise, then least privilege is a means to stop them escalating from, you know, a small security breach to all of your customers basically being sold on the dark web, uh, which apparently is a popular hobby at the moment since it's happened to two service providers in the last week. Um, and um, yeah, if you try and keep components within their boxes, then um, there is much, much less likelihood that they will get to data that you thought was well separated from, from the box that's been compromised. Um, I think we've established previously that um, least privilege is hard for us to implement. There are a lot of things that we want to do with networking um, that tend to lead to um, asking for privilege, um, particularly Capsis admin as one example. Um, but uh, other things are set up in such a way that um, having uh, root privileges over the containers file system is you know, necessary to get things working. Um, doesn't mean to say that those things can't be fixed by relatively straightforward means, but I think we have to establish to begin with that they do need fixing, that simply grabbing the root user and having right, right access over the whole file system or, or file access over the whole file system is, is a dangerous thing and not 100% necessary to making your application work. Um, basically, educating developers uh, and I think developers here are one of the larger audiences for this, educating developers that there are options available to them that isn't a blanket statement that, oh yeah, just grab privilege because you know, you'll know you never ever be able to work without it. Um, I've broken out some of the things that came to my mind um, and Taylor as well, I shouldn't take all the credit here, um, for um, problems. One of them is uh, performance the performance of an application in a networking world is tied up the, by the fact that you've got a lot of packets coming in on a regular basis that you have to get rid of before more packets come in because you know the world doesn't stop and traffic doesn't wait for you to process it um so there is uh, an, a calculation here that i've done in front of people many times before now within my company and to customers that i work with but um i thought it was worth writing down here um it's a very academic thing to consider in the sense that, you know, yes, I have to basically do numbers and make calculations and uh, uh, you can rework these calculations for yourself if you want. But effectively, uh, we are not serving websites where a user will, you know, accept anything that turns up within a second. Uh, we are moving packets and if packets don't get moved in milliseconds, then packets get dropped. Um, that isn't the level of performance that platforms are typically optimized for because that isn't the level of performance that anyone else requires. Uh, they almost certainly won't say no, but it's never very high on their shopping list to get things turned around in half a millisecond. Um, and it makes a difference to um, the tuning of the application. And it typically means that grabbing high level privileges so that you can prioritize your components over or your, your most critical components um, is, um, you know, often seen as necessary. Um, and then a wide ranging list of networking behaviors. Um, the document explains this in more detail. And if I sit here and talk through the entirety of the document, you're all gonna get bored with me, but those are the ones that um, have a section in this document at this point in time, because they tend to be the ones that come up that we've, at least in many cases, previously discussed in these meetings and in the chat um, to say that 
these are reasons why we grab privilege because we're trying to do things that are out of the ordinary again uh, doing them requires us to lay hands on rights that aren't necessarily well av uh, widely available to Kubernetes applications. Um, in summary, I would say that it isn't so much that you can't do these things in Kubernetes. It's often that using those platform grade privileges is necessary because there isn't a finer grained way of getting exactly the right you need in order to get the task done. Um, you know, I, if I want specific fine grained scheduling behavior i have no way of asking for that for the platform from the platform and the platform offers no concrete guarantees that it will happen as a matter of course without asking for additional behavior similarly uh, tau we discussed this last week sctp as an example typically has a kernel module that you require in order to enable it there's no guarantee that the platform in actually loads or includes that kernel module and you were saying that in fact in your case uh, you don't like to include it because you consider it to be a security concern. Um, uh, and, not and me sure. personally, but uh, Red Hat, RHEL yes. by default. Doesn't. Yes, yeah. true enough. Um, I, I am judging you by the company you work for. Uh, you can always leave if you don't like standing for Red Hat on the call. Um, so uh, it, it, it's often the case that what we're trying to do here isn't necessarily impossible. It's just not practical in the current world that we live in. It, it may be that certain areas of the platform need enhancement to make this, if not, you, you know, not just possible, but beautiful, elegant from a, um, an application design perspective. Um, and I think that's perfectly acceptable to say, no one's saying that Kubernetes is, is, is polished and perfect, is never gonna change. But um, yeah, without setting down some ground rules, like as an SCTP as an example, that all platforms would load that module and include it, or alternatively, that there is a means to ask for the level of functionality that you're looking for, then you get into difficulty writing applications that consume it. Um, again, I can talk and talk and talk on this. It, it's an interesting topic, but this is a meeting where you're supposed to do the talking, I'm supposed to chair it. So um, I don't know what your thoughts are on this uh, or whether you want to give this document more study either now or later on and see what you think. Um, so I, I read much of it, and I think it's a great document. This is really useful. <laughs> I, I, I like uh, these detailed discussions because there's a lot to discuss. Um, a quick note, you know, if we, if we scroll up, I think the two aspects you identify that the principle gives us, which is um, isolation and protection. Um, well, least privilege does provide those, but if those are our goals, there are other principles that can provide that, right? If our goal is isolation and say we do need to use, I don't know, the root user for some reason, um, maybe the trick is not to think of it in terms of least pri privilege, but in, in ways of how can we increase isolation? So just a, an example uh, is Kata containers, right? That's, or, or Google's Gvisor, right? There are if our goal is isolation and we can't achieve isolation using least privilege, maybe there are other things we can do. And of course, protection, as I keep pointing out, the whole field of security is far, far more than this principle, right? So there's a lot of ways to achieve protection and all the things that, that are mentioned here, you know, in, in terms of, um, I, I guess I'm saying th these two topics, isolation and protection, are worthy of discussing in and of themselves without connection necessarily to this principle. Yeah. yeah. I, I wouldn't disagree but, with that. I was trying to find arguments for least privilege, not arguments that least privilege is the only way to do certain things. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Al, what we want to end up with at some point is here is a practice that someone can implement. and we can get to the many different practices that you can have out of, especially if you said, we want to follow security practices. Well, that's gonna be a wide set. So we're trying to narrow it down so that we can end up with some, but it doesn't mean as a group, we must focus on least privilege and we must focus on non root It's just the first of many things. Mm. I think, I mean, t t taking up your points about Kata containers and Gvisor, then the question would be, in both cases, um, the 
experimental method here, which is why are people not using these things to implement CNFs? Um, which I don't think they are. I mean, I certainly haven't seen it. Um, if they are the right thing to do, why is it that it's not occurred to anybody? Um, could you implement a CNF with them? Um, so you, you could take that forward and ask yourself um, from an experimental basis, what's putting people off? Uh, from a practical basis, um, sort of tied to the experimental, but more, more, again, academic in nature, is could you implement a CNF with either of those technologies? Is there something that completely forbids you or prevents you from, from writing a CNF using those technologies? And certainly it's not going to be as easy. There are certain hurdles to overcome, like the way, again, in which we access the network could you access the network in the, with either of those technologies in place? Um, but those are topics, again, we could explore independently. Um, your point is correct, though, that both isolation and protection, you could ask yourself um, for something that nominally provides isolation or protection, is it a reasonable option to give you a better platform than the one that we're currently looking at? Um, so, so to keep it on topic of, you know, in this specific least privileged principle, we're not talking only about not using root user. That's one way to reduce privileges. But for example, to make sure that all your files are right protected or, you know, that the, 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 the mod attributes are all, you know, just for your user, things like that. There, there are a lot of little things that you can do that um, are easy, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And um, um, it's different than, you know, wanting to, so, so I, I guess I'm separating, there's the, the notion of the privilege keyword, right, for pods that makes them privileged containers. But we're also talking about uh, general operating system privileges, right? Uh, read yep. write privileges. This, se this section is the general tell. Um, right. If, Ian, can you scroll down to um, the section Thursday, June 15th? which you could also find on the left, but. Yeah, there we go. So um, tell this section has a whole list of potential practices that are all somewhat related to this area. So no root in container would just be one that we picked right now. Running a container with the privilege flag or not running it would be another practice. There's a lot of different ones. Pod should not mount host directories as volumes. They're, these are just practices. So, and we have them um, if, if uh, we don't need to go through all these sections, but whoever wants to read it. Um, the other sections where we're talking about least privilege uh, or non root or whatever, a topic may have, a thought may have come up, like what you're saying, Tal, and saying, what about this and this? We'll write those down. The, this principle of least privilege is the general. Yeah. We'll probably it, end up with a whole set of practices that reference whatever this is called. We do, like Ian was saying, it's not exactly like a user story right now. We may end up with some user stories in it, but it's. I think what we're going to probably have more than that is a write-up around the the general principle of least privilege. And then we can have a whole set of practices uh, that come out of that. And maybe references to other, um, other topics around isolation and protection, Tal. We could have those just reference to other documents. Uh, isolation itself may be like a focused uh, use case on the need for isolation and protection. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, you know, because you've seen what we've been presenting over the course of the weeks, you'll notice that we've been working backwards pretty much from the beginning, right? We should not use routing containers, therefore there's a reason for that and we should figure out what that reason is and so on. It, it's kind of, it's a strange way of approaching it, but the problem is that you, you kind of, I would say as a developer, I, it, the idea of using the least quantity of privileges is, is ingrained in what you do at this point in time. Um, you know you should, 
sometimes it's a little difficult to articulate the reasons why you feel that's a good thing. So, you know, because it covers a whole bunch of stuff. So having, we started with no written containers, you can see if you follow the timeline up from this meeting that we had a couple of weeks ago, back upwards, then you'll find, well, it's right. Okay. So that's one point of least privilege. What other least privilege practices amount to, again, least privilege, here's a long list then it's like, okay, well, now let us work out the broad statement of why least privilege is sensible, which is the document that we, or, or at least the skeleton that we have in, in the latest round that we were discussing, which literally was half an hour ago at this point, um, to, to get to why these least privilege rules are actually being helpful. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's a broad topic. Um, can, can I point another interesting tension here that I think is pretty obvious, but everything we're seeing on screen right now, which is a great list, <laughs> there's probably even more things we can add, mm. but it's um, none of this is specific to telco. This is just good. This is a good principle for working on Kubernetes. Indeed. And of course, much of this document too, we deal into well, the specific requirements with telco with networking, et cetera. Um, there, it's a tension here, right? In a way, this this part shouldn't be worked on just in this working group. These kinds of this idea of how to apply the principle and tips for doing it are general tips for Kubernetes, right? They shouldn't be owned by our working group to an extent. But then the telco requirements have to do with well. Sometimes we do need <laughs> privileges. The, the, the telco requirements, I think, emphasize the need for security separation, least privilege, because again, we've got requirements on performance where privilege will mess up any guarantee you can promise. Um, we are, and I know you've debated this particular point as well, but the general assumption here is that the platform is separated and supplied by someone different from the application, which isn't generally true of uh, applications in the wider world, right? Plenty of application teams, and I, I, again, we can pick on OpenShift here, but I think you'll find that uh, people paying for platforms from third-party vendors are often then developing the, you know, they're the application team paying for the platform, not an independent operator paying for the platform and an application from two vendors, which is the, the concept that we're kind of expecting in the world of CNFs. And also the idea that we're running multiple applications from potentially multiple vendors and or development teams on a single platform. These are the things that emphasize the requirement for least privilege over and above what other people might see. But you're absolutely right that most of these are best practices. They're just not so emphatically useful in other people's problem spaces. I'm not quite sure what to do with that, though, because we, to an extent, I, I kind of wish this list, what we're seeing on screen right now, would be open to other members of the Kubernetes community. I know that's very huge, you know, other industries that are involved. Um, this is an area where, you know, it, it, it seems perfect for collaboration. I, I have no idea how to manage that exactly. Um, I wonder if it's in the general topic of the Kubernetes uh, security, right? I, I think there's a SIG for security. Yeah, and if you look at what Falco's doing, then it, it's quite interesting. It's more on the auditing, you know, the first do it, then check it kind of side of things. But um, absolutely, it's clear that people have looked at this sort of thing before, yes. Yeah, it's audit, audit and uh, remediation. Like if you start a sh uh, shell in a container not expecting, then it can kill the pod as an example. Yeah, which, you know, trust but verify is a perfectly good thing. Um, but firstly, you need to know what you're trusting them to do. And I think this is, uh, a again, maybe not the entire set of rules, but a set of rules that's quite useful for that. So, well, that it, that being the case, then we're all basically talking without necessarily 
close insight into what's happening in the security um, community. Um, does anyone, assuming that none of us are actually there, then do we have any contacts over there that we go and sort of pick the brains of? I, I show up to every one of their meetings and I, I'm involved in that space. So if there's a specific thing you want out of my group, I'm happy to make introductions. I think, yes, I'm not sure it's specific. I think it's more a general question of how we could benefit from their learnings, assuming that they've gone studied this rather more directly because it's their immediate focus. Then I'm thinking that, as, as Tal says, there's probably other skills out there and more to the point, this list is not just for us necessarily. But what I recommend is um, you put together a short uh, talk, maybe five to 10 minutes worth, uh, put, it on, uh, put it on their calendar. Uh, the way you put it on their calendar is by opening a pull request against the, uh, against the security uh, technical advisory group and uh, give a talk and then ask for, ask for help and see, see what they say. Okay. Let me get some minutes written up, but please keep discussing while I type. Don't don't let me stop you. The um, the two people you can uh, actually three people you can ask for help there. Um, the first one is Emily Fox. Uh, the second one is Brandon Loom L U M, and uh, the third one is Andres Vega. And any one of them can help with uh, with getting involved with that community as well. And Andrew who? So Emily Fox, Brandon Lum, L-U-M. Uh, third person is Andres Vega. And uh, one M on Loom. One M in what, sorry? Uh, for Loom, it's just one M. Perfect. Andres is um, involved. He works on uh, Spire and Spiffy stuff. And there, uh, project-wise, on the sig the tag security, you have folks that are in, in, um, working on Falco which is the, was originally from uh, SysDig security mm. company. And they, it does runtime um, security checks as well as like pre-checks. And the people from the OPA team um, are also on that. So, I mean, the tag security is one place we could also reach directly out to the projects. On the um, test suite, we're actually trying to talk directly with a few of them because we're wanting to get, utilize the tools for testing specific things. Um, Falco has a, some stuff around privilege like the non-root user checks. Uh, checking for any root user and any process for all the containers running. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't want to limit this to exclusively runtime checks. I think if we can get static analysis um, as well, because static for analysis sure. is right. If you spot something going wrong at runtime, it's too late because whatever you're running is probably not going to deal well with you just murdering things when it thinks it's about to get started. But um, yeah, uh, we need both parts of this. Mm -hmm. So they've also published two white papers, one on cloud native security and the second one on supply chain security. Um, and there is a security controls group that, let me see if I can find the, uh, the spreadsheet for it. But in short, they have a spreadsheet that they're developing. It's not finalized yet. That uh, goes over the uh, variety of different security controls. Uh, there, the purpose of that one was initially so they can give to groups like 
auditors or people who are building baselines so that they can work out uh, like a lot of a lot of people who are who are in the, that particular chain are not Kubernetes experts. And so when they say something like, is data in transit encrypted? It's like, where do you start? Um, or if there's if if there's a policy saying you must have firewalls and then you're mm -hmm. running Kubernetes and there's no firewall on the edge of Kubernetes, then why is Kubernetes sufficient? What controls are there that's sufficient that could help replace a, uh, a firewall, which might be your ingress controllers or other similar mm -hmm. types of, of things? So there's so there's a security controls group that is relatively new that is also putting things together, it'd be good to go over the documentation that's been produced by that group to see if there's any other security related things that we could tie into it if, if that's yeah. of interest. Yeah, and, and I think you have to be careful with some of these statements because for instance, encryption in motion as an example uh, is um, widely touted as an answer to uh, security problems, um, but it isn't always appropriate depending on what you're doing. If what your main job is, is to move traffic as fast as possible with the least amount of CPU uh, and encryption in mo it, it, and the traffic is moving over a network where it's mostly not encrypted before it comes to you, then encrypting it, you know, between your components as an example gets you absolutely nothing. The, what I'm saying is that all security rules you have to put into context. They don't necessarily apply just because they've been written down once. Absolutely, and that's that's something that th those groups are very uh, aware of. But it's how do you articulate this in a way that someone who is not in that particular field, uh, and we, we actually see this problem in the zero trust space quite heavily. It's like you have one camp that says, "Why do I need this? We have sufficient defenses already," and then you have the uh, the opposite camp, which is literally, "Wow, I can put gates, I, I can put gates in every single component of my system and check them every single time for every piece of communication, mm. every every moment of every day," and which then you end up with uh, extremely high granularity of, or you, have, you end up with very fine grained controls, but you also end up with something that uh, costs so much from a from a runtime perspective that you end up killing your availability and your costs goes through through the roof. Yeah. And so, and then there's a wide spectrum in, in the middle where there may be trade-offs you can make on either side that land you into a secure, or not secure, but into a more secure stance than, than we have today without sacrificing uh, security or, or cost. Or honestly, maintainability, because obviously encrypting everything gets you less and less insight into what's happening every single time you do it. But um, yeah, the, there's always trade-offs in this. Well, actually, yeah. that's the wrong thing to say. There aren't always trade-offs in this. The ones that we should be recommending as best practices first are the ones where you're actually not trading anything. Yeah, and you have to look at what's called the residual value at the end of the day, which is what is the thing you're defending? What is the cost of defending it? What's the value when you put the two of them together? And like, what's the remaining value of, of that information or data or so on? And so it, it, it very much, people think, oh, it's just a technical thing. No, it very much ties into a business need. And if the security costs that are, you're required to put in exceed the cost of doing business, then uh, in some scenarios, you may even ask, should we even be doing this in the first place? Mm -hmm. And so... Uh, or you, maybe you maybe you go back and try to work out why is this thing so expensive because maybe maybe there's a better way to do it or maybe the value that you place on something might be wrong. So I mean, a lot of different places you can look. But yeah, in in short, um, all, all of this ends up tying to to the business at the end of the day because some business leader has to make a decision on whether or not they accept the risk, whether or not they accept the cost, uh, or um, or other stances that uh, that are other types of actions that are present. Okay. So um, next steps. Uh, who wants to prepare that ten minute briefing? I think we can safely answer nobody. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, to be honest, this, the document that uh, Ian, you and uh, Taylor created is, is a great start. If it can be boiled down to a few slides, 
Yeah, uh, and I think if we could focus it from away from here is a shopping list of things that we, we would want to do, because frankly, um, I think we'd be uh, teaching granny to suck eggs at that point and uh, keep it to the high level of why it matters or what is most important in a telco space, which they might not have considered, then that would seem to be the way to present this. We want to be teaching things they don't already know. So yeah, yeah by I'm the sure way, we could put that together. In the future, and, and maybe this is something we could do through here, I would like to eventually do a more in-depth talk there that discusses things like the uh, various 5G protocols and the security deficiencies that exist in some of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, that way that people become informed and they can then become part of that uh, perspective. So for example, the, uh, the, uh, the 5G uh, user uh, tunneling uh, protocol that we end up using ends up uh, the whether you're logged in or not is a bit it says this user has been successfully logged in you set it to one and then they gain access and unencrypted so so, so the protocols themselves need to have something else that's that's attached to them or there needs to be some out of band thing or you accept like we said you could always accept the risk um, whether that's a good idea or not is probably not a good idea. But yeah, in, in short, it would be it'd be good to raise some of these type of things into those environments because then the 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 security community at large could then brainstorm ideas that we could effectively do in the Kubernetes space that would move Kubernetes from being just a hey we can run this at, at higher density and lower cost, presumably lower cost, to we can run this thing with all those benefits, but also get a more secure stance because of things that Kubernetes brings to the table. And that would be a very powerful message to push mm -hmm. forward Kubernetes-based uh, environments. I would, I'd like to get um, this first best practice put forward with maybe a, a write-up on the least privilege that we understand into the GitHub repo. And then we could present that to tag security and say, this is, we're trying to apply this to networking applications and take all of these um, recommendations and put them out there and then ask for their help um, on that so that we can say, we're taking steps and we'd like to get your input mm. versus not having a, any type of, of finish thing and saying we're waiting for you to do it or something would be different. Okay, so I think we could probably do this in parallel to see how it works out. We can get this write up um, framed, documented, committed. And in the process of getting it framed, documented, and committed, we could be writing up a few slides for the 10 minute presentation, see how they come out as a pair rather than necessarily saying one then the other. Would that work? Yeah, I mean, definitely write up, like, would do a presentation and intro, like, what are we doing? What are, where are we trying to go? And then, and then actually give an example of here's one that we're working on and we've published. We'd like to add more and get your input on the ones that we're doing. They can happen in parallel, the work can happen in parallel and I'm happy to help with mm. both presentation as well as yeah. trying to get the well, I don't think out. Writing five slides is gonna take us very long. I think writing five, the right five slides might take us a bit longer, but it'd be, again, if we, if we if we make the attempt, we'll see how far we're getting. We'll see whether they're having any success. So um, I, I haven't read the document, but um, one thing that I noticed is uh, I, I haven't seen any examples. Uh, do you think that it's important to have this one code example or something to, to use a way to exemplify uh, some of the best practices or, or something? Or do um, you think that the way that it is, is good enough for, for anyone. I think what you're asking for is effectively the best practices that this suggests. Um, yeah. I do think having examples is a good thing. 
um, that look here is what we often see a in practice here B is what you could be doing and here is how to get to B. yes absolutely um, but that does sound like a best practice because then we're making a recommendation of you should do this but yeah I mean I, I agree with you uh, examples are great and that's what we should get to we, we if we write documents that are not comprehensible then obviously nobody's going to use them so um, the simpler we make it the better it will be Right, um, we have nine minutes remaining. Um, we've talked about this. There's nothing else on the agenda, but I wanted to throw it open to see if there's anything else people wanted to talk about or any work they've been up to that they would like to kind of um, mention here. Um, I've, I've started working on my uh, discussion for a networking orchestration, but uh, mm -hmm. nothing that I'll show public quite yet. It's still very early. I'm really interested in that. And I'd very much like to see that as soon as you get the opportunity or as soon as you basically have something that you're not going to cringe with by every time you present <laughs> it in public. Uh, yeah. I think that would be worth doing. Um, any more? OK. One thing I think that came up in passing there, something Frederick mentioned, that, you know, some of these things are probably worth a, you know, could benefit from a technical presentation of however long. Um, we always kind of get tied up with the idea that technical presentations have to go into KubeCon and therefore we can't get into KubeCon, so we never get to make our technical presentations, isn't it upsetting? Um, in a world of being online and working from home all the time and being, wondering whether or not we're ever gonna be allowed to attend conferences again anyway, we can do technical presentations whenever we want, right? We can basically um, have someone make them, set a time for them, record them. I, I, I'm sure uh, Bill and his team will happily put them on YouTube for us as well. Um, there is always that option. We don't have to wait for the perfect moment. So if there are any technical presentations either people want to give or they want to receive, then I suggest uh, we start making a list of things that we might be willing to, you know, put ourselves out there um, for an hour and actually produce. I did actually want to ask on that. I was looking for a, a tug presentation and I couldn't find it on YouTube. I think YouTube hasn't been updated in quite a while. I expected that all these uh, meetings would automatically be added, but I guess it's uh, by request. Uh, um, I can check, or Bill, if if you want to check, um, that some of the people that were doing that were out, so they're just we may have like a queue it needs to be worked through. If okay. you have a specific, if you can go back to a specific date and and request like say i don't see this one then yeah they, sh they should all be on youtube well. yeah okay maybe i i'll check again thanks yeah well if you don't find it tell then just reach out and give the specific date for and whether it's tag or um the cnf working group who should I reach out to, Bill or you? Either one. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, we seem to have come to a natural pause. If no one's got anything further to add, then I will give you five whole minutes back so you can <laughs> run to the bathroom before your next meeting. All right. Thank you very much, everybody, and I'll see you again next time, which should be next week, shouldn't it? We, that's the yep. week after next. All right. Next Monday. Have a good Cheers week. Cheers, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.